I learned shortly after graduating that, and this was a really, this is central probably to our conversation today, John. I realized that the two greatest expenses in life are taxes yep. and the interest expense on debt. Mm -hmm. And from that point forward, when I learned that in my early 20s, I set about on this mission to educate myself as much as humanly possible around money. Are you tired of trying to keep ahead in the rat race only to have so much of your hard earned money going to the tax collector? Equity doesn't pay the bills. Retirement savings don't pay you now and there are only 24 hours in a day to work. The only solution is passive income that pays you 24 seven now, not 40 years from now. From vetted investment opportunities to tax saving strategies. Let John guide you through all the confusion and take control of your financial life in pursuit of financial freedom. So sit back, relax, and welcome to the Wealth and Freedom Nexus. Are you tired of gambling your hard-earned savings with the casinos of Wall Street? Don't you wish you could generate passive cash flow from tangible assets that produce proven in-demand products? Our friends at Agronostotris allow passive investors to participate alongside them in their sustainable agricultural projects. So now you can caffeinate your cash flow with the second most traded commodity in the world after oil, coffee and sweeten up your returns with high-end artisanal chocolate. Diversify your portfolio and participate in coffee and cacao farms in Panama that are turnkey managed for you with farming, processing, and product sales all done for you. And you impact the lives of subsistence farmers by helping provide housing and education through their socially sustainable programs. To find out more, go to wealthandfreedomnexus.com slash coffee. That's wealthandfreedomnexus.com slash coffee. Taxes are your biggest expense. The best way to reduce your burden is real estate. Increase your income with amazing returns and reduce your taxable income with real estate write-offs. As an employee with a high salary, you're devastated by taxes. Lighten your burden with real estate tax incentives. You can offset your income with a W-2 job and from capital gains. Freedom Family Investments is the experienced partner you've been looking for. Our real estate insider fund is the vehicle. This fund invests in real estate projects that make an impact, and you can join us with as little as $50,000. Insiders get preferred returns of 10 to 12%. This means you get paid first. Insiders enjoy cash flow on a quarterly basis, and the tax benefits are life-changing. Join the Freedom Family and become a real estate insider. Start on your path to financial freedom through passive income. Text FAMILY to 66866. That's FAMILY to 66. Eight six six. This is not a solicitation. Please text regarding this opportunity for complete details. This is for accredited investors only. Hey, welcome back to another great episode of the WFN podcast. <laughs> Hard to believe that we are nearing the end of June here of 2023 with episode number 88. Now, if this is the first time joining us, be sure to check out all my free resources available at wfreedomnexus.com. You can also follow me on my social media tags of that same name. I'm most active on Twitter and Instagram, but also been releasing trying to release new videos daily on my youtube channel as well we'll see if that continues over the summer now today's guest brought on you might remember from let's see this was one two three four four episodes ago with murray the debt buster this was episode number 84 I talked about busting up your debt now this is a very similar but yet very different this is actually a method of shredding your debt and this isn't really anything new per se in fact well just a little teaser this is kind of how australia Australians have 
tackled their debt over the last many years or decades even. In fact, actually, I heard of this method back in, geez, this is back in my copier sales days. This had to be back in 2009, maybe 2010. I can't remember exactly. So this is nothing new, but unfortunately, it isn't gaining mainstream news. And the reason for that is, well, the banks don't like this. The banks want to make as much money as possible, boost their profit margins, pay their shareholders, et cetera. So they want to organize the loans, amortize the loans in their favor, not yours. So this is just a different method of tackling debt to shred it down in record time. Now, if you follow me for any length of time, you know, read my blog, seen my shorts or Facebook profile, you know that I'm actually a good proponent or a big proponent of good debt. And I do believe there is a good debt. Good debt basically puts money in your pocket. Many times the payments for that debt is paid for or outsourced to someone else. Maybe, you know, quick example, you have a 30-year fixed, long-term fixed rate mortgage on a rental property, maybe fixed at, well, 3.875% like I do. And it's on a turnkey property, say through uh, Mid-South Home Buyers down in Memphis. And maybe that property is appreciated by almost 50% since you purchased it about three years ago, yet that payment is still locked in. The rent has gone up. When that payment is locked in for, uh, let's see, this is until 2050. <laughs> so I am a big believer that there is good debt out there and bad debt. Now, if you're a Dave Ramsey fan, which I'm not, you might just look through a you know lens that all debt is bad. You want to just get rid of all debt, and you know there's nothing to say about you know bad to say about that. There's you know some people unfortunately just aren't good at managing their money, and being debt free probably is the best route for them without going down rabbit holes of arbitrage or you know smart debt financing, simple interest versus compound interest, etc. So with that, my guest today is Adam Carroll who has, I won't say pioneered, but really been the proponent for what is called the shred method when it comes to tackling debt. So if you maybe are, maybe just, you know, in over your head, or maybe the amount of debt you have is just daunting. And I'm going to focus solely on, you know, car loan debt, student loan debt, credit card debt, really kind of the bad debt that can get to double digit interest rates, not collateralized by a cash flowing asset per se. You know, I would agree that everyone should really knock down and tackle those debts. So we will get into the, today's interview with Adam after a word from our valued sponsors. Are you a podcaster who finds yourself drowning in an endless task that goes into producing a show? From editing to creating show notes and audiograms, it can all be overwhelming. But what if we told you that Lightbulb Podcasting has a solution to make your life easier and your content even better? With our exceptional services and top-notch support, we can help you create captivating content that will keep your listeners engaged and coming back for more. So say goodbye to long hours spent editing and creating show notes. Say hello to more time to focus on your creativity. Let us help you bring your show to life in a way you never thought possible. Visit us at www.lightbulbpodcasting.com and discover how we can help take your podcast to the next level. Hey, Adam, the Shred Man, how are you doing? And uh, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, I'm doing great, John. Thank you for having me. I'm excited about our conversation here. Yeah, you as well. So now as I alluded to, to the intro, I think, you know, debt can kind of take all different forms and I think it affects people differently. And contrary to Dave Ramsey, I do think there is good debt versus bad debt. But before we dive into, the, you know, kind of the meat of our conversation, can you give us just a brief background on yourself and where you're joining us from? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a Midwest guy, grew up in Iowa, went to college in Iowa, was a debt statistic after I graduated from school, as most oh, people okay. are. I didn't even know that was a job or a position or anything. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was one of those guys who made all sorts of financial mistakes early on in my career. So okay. I learned shortly after graduating that, and this was a really, this is central probably to our conversation today, John, I realized that the two greatest expenses in life are taxes yep. and the interest expense on debt. Mm -hmm. And from that point forward, when I learned that in my early 20s, I set about on this mission to educate myself as much as humanly possible around money. And that was kind of all facets. I wanted to know okay. about making it, about saving it, about investing it. 
uh, growing wealth, building business, you know, investing in real estate, tax planning. And for about the last 15 years or so, I have just consumed massive numbers of books on the topic. And they say now, if you read seven books on any topic, you're considered an expert in that topic. Oh, interesting. So today, I consider myself a financial educator, and I've been doing that kind of work for about a decade and a half. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. And I'm all for financial education. I kind of fell into it myself after reading that purple book that I'm sure so many people have heard about rich dad, poor dad, and then just yes. kind of snowballed from there. Yeah. I think that was the one that got most of us started candidly. Yep. <laughs> and I don't know if that was just like brilliant timing on Robert Kiyosaki's part, or it was divine guidance or something, but man, that book came out. I think it grabbed people by the ears and said, you have to listen to this. This is the problem with yeah. you know the way society's functioning. Exactly. So now as we kind of get into our conversation, I know you said the two biggest expenses the average American has is taxes, which you know, I've brought up a number of times on the show of how to minimize or hack your tax, if you will. But yep. then following up with that is the interest on debt, you know, the interest on our credit cards, our car loans, our student loans, our yeah. personal loans, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, what exactly is your shred method when it comes to, you know, paying off debt and how did you come up with that? Yeah, I think the the best way to describe it, John, is to give your listeners, you and your listeners, a sense of where we came from contextually in creating it. Okay. So, you know, we live in a banker's business model. Would you agree mm -hmm. with that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the bankers, you know, if you look around, you drive within a, a mile radius of my house there will be no less than 20 bank branches. <laughs> Credit unions, banks, they're building a $10 million structure, actually two different $10 million structures in, in you know, on one street that's half a mile away and the other direction, half a mile away, same thing, building a $10 yeah. million structure. They're banks and these banks won't be profitable for probably three to five years. You know, so you wonder like, where is all the money coming from that the banks can, you know, can <laughs> afford to do this? And then when you realize that we as consumers are actually the bank's compound interest vehicle, mm -hmm. and the more we borrow and the more we leverage the bank's, you know, services, if you will, their products, which are our loans, the more profitable they are. It's one of the most profitable business models known to man. And so I started looking at that intently and began to wonder what if we functioned like a bank? Or we began to challenge the notion that just because the bank says, oh, you borrowed X amount for your home or your car or mm -hmm. for college, and it's at this interest rate with this payment, you're going to pay it over a long period of time. What if we challenge that maybe that's not the most efficient thing to do? And so the shred method was kind of born out of that. Now, I okay. will say, John, this was, it's known as an Australian mortgage. So I'm not okay. the, the founding father of this by any <laughs> means, but I think we've adapted and modified the approach to where it, it works very, very efficiently for, you know, for groups of people. Sure. No, it makes sense. So, and now I'm familiar with the Australian mortgage. I mean, I think I first got introduced to, well, I want to say 2010, 11, maybe somewhere in there. And I'm familiar with it, but maybe all my listeners aren't as familiar with it, but maybe high level, maybe we'll start with, you know, how our U.S. mortgages work or how our standard yeah. debt works and how maybe the rest of the world or the Australians factor it in. Great start. So let's, let's assume that someone buys a $300,000 home. Okay. They, they take out a mortgage for 300 grand. So maybe it's 330 and they put 10% down, right? So a $300,000 mortgage. The way that U.S. mortgages work is you are charged interest based on the balance of that loan from the previous month. Mm -hmm. So at the end of February, your lender, your mortgage company said, okay, you owed $300,000. Your interest rate is 6%. Mm -hmm. Based on that, here's how much interest you're going to pay on that note. So it's 300,000 times 6% divided by 12. That's your number, right? Okay. And what most people don't ever question is how much of my payment is going to principal versus going to interest. <laughs> yep. And so for your listeners that maybe they've just bought a home or they're in a home for the first two years, what I want you to really pay attention to is on your very next mortgage statement, 
how much of your payment is going to principal and how, how much of it is going to interest. Mm-hmm. By and large, in the first seven years of a mortgage, the lion's share of it's going towards interest. Yep. And I think and, ironically, the isn't it like the average mortgage tends to get refinanced or redone about every seven years. So it's kind of like just restarts the process for 100%. the banks then. And sometimes even less, sometimes it's five years. Most people mm-hmm. stay in their home and or their mortgage five to five and a half years. Okay. So if you're refinancing and think, you know, some people are doing this every two years, every three years, yeah. but all they're doing is resetting the clock back to zero where the yeah. majority of their payment goes to interest, not to principal. Mm-hmm. And I think there's this, there, there are some justifications for this in society. One is, well, I get to write off my mortgage interest. Yeah. Right. And in 2017, they changed the tax code so that a couple could take a standard deduction of $25,900. Right. And I want you to figure out how much interest (laughs) are you actually paying? Because you're probably better off taking the standard deduction and getting it all as opposed to, you know, saying, well, if I keep refinancing, I'll get to write off a ton. You really (laughs) don't. You really don't. So in 2017, it became kind of a moot point. Like, why not? begin paying down your mortgage or paying off your mortgage because you're not really getting a a mass benefit from that. The second justification is, well, it's my home and it's appreciating anyway. Yeah. Right. And you know, your home really has no internal rate of return. Mm -hmm. It grows 3% or 5% or whatever it appreciates a year, Yeah, but it's not like it's going to guarantee a six or seven or 10% return. Like, you know, some people will say the stock market will, Though I find (laughs) yeah, on average, right? Over a hundred year span. Yeah. And this this is all part of the challenge that I was seeing was the majority of folks today, I say majority, but a large percentage, will get to retirement age and they're still panicked about how much they have in savings and whether or not they're going to outlive their money. Would you agree Mm -hmm. with that? Agreed, yeah. And with the shred method, one of our goals is how do we take away that uncertainty and create a very certain retirement by minimizing the amount of money that we're paying into the bank and interest, Mm -hmm. minimize, minimizing our overall monthly mortgage payment over Mm -hmm. time, and then using whatever equity we have and additional income we've created to build massive, passive, permanent streams of income that cover your monthly expenses. Right. And when you do that, you're financially free. And for most Mm -hmm. people, and I don't, I don't, you know, speak of this lightly. I really believe this. I think most people could be financially free within 10 years, John. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I think a lot of it just comes down to perseverance, dedication, and, you know, I guess just putting your feet to the fire and doing it. (laughs) 100% habits, knowing what's possible. You know, I mean, I think that's part of it is we are told, you know, from the time we're young, well, you're going to work till you're 65 and now it's probably going to be 70. Yeah. And that was a, that was a, a number that was just surreptitiously put out there by the government to keep yeah. people working. Number one. Yeah. Well, wasn't, I think the, or at least the first mention of that number, I think 65, I think it was actually Bismarck back in Germany when they had their first pension plans. And then for whatever reason, FDR, you know, copied it, went off it, copied it, plucked it yep. out of the air, whatever. When you know, started social security, it's like, hey, the average person lives till 62. Hey, we're going to put 65 as the withdrawal rate. Oh, we should be fine. And fast forward 100 years. Oh, crap. People are living into their 70s, 80s, 90s, and even 100s. This is not yeah. working out well. <laughs> and I saw this math the other day that was really interesting. It said, well, I'll do, I'll use this on you, John, if you'll be my guinea pig. Sure. So when was your very first job? My very first. First job delivering weekly newspapers. I think I was 12, maybe. <laughs> 12. Okay. Yep. And when did you first start working, quote unquote, for real? Like when was your first uh, real job? A real job where I, I'll say real job where I got to understand just how much taxes Uncle Sam will take from you. I was 16 working at the local grocery store. Okay. Okay. And when would you say you got your first real full-time income, like your first W-2 full-time? Uh, real full-time W-2 income. Let's see, that'd be 2007 when I started selling office equipment. Okay. So 07, you were how old? 22, 23? Let's see. Let's see. 83, well, 24? 24. Yeah, 24. Okay, yeah, 24. <laughs> so I let's just turned 40. That... So I'm like, oh, geez, that was almost half my life ago. <laughs> Let's assume at 24, you start working full-time 
And when will you, when do you think you'll retire? What's your retirement date that you've put for yourself? I always, yeah, I always kind of put it at 59 and a half just because I can take money out of my Roth IRA tax free. So (laughs) yeah, gotcha. So 24 to 59 is 25 years of work, right? I'm sorry, 35 years. 35, yeah. 35 years of work. And when do you think you will expire? Like, when do you think you'll pass away? Uh, It's a morbid question, but yeah, it's yeah, a little morbid. I would, if history is any guide, I'd say average, maybe 80, (laughs) 80. Yeah. So 21 years of your life, essentially, you will have to be able to live a comfortable retirement having worked for 35 years of your life. Yeah. And when I did the numbers, mine were, I worked for 37 and I would be alive for 37. Oh, wow. So if you think about like how many, how much money do you need to set aside in order to be able to live for that amount of time? If you're you know withdrawing some of the funds and hopefully mm-hmm. it's earning some percentage, but in reality where people say, oh, well, you know, when you're older, when you're retired, your expenses should go down. Yeah. Right. It's not, it hasn't <laughs> proven to be true at all. Yeah. And so we have to have a different model of how we're looking at retirement and retirement planning. And I think the shred method is a great way to do that because it does not leave you uncertain at the end. It creates certainty at the end that you know exactly how you're going to live and how much you have to live because Mm -hmm. of the process we go through. Yeah. Well, and I like the, you know, you're kind of speaking my language with the certainty and then the streams of passive income, because I think society, we are just so hung up on you know, having this pile of money in retirement and throwing your numbers, you know, the 5% drawdown, 4%, 3%, you know, way things are going, maybe down to 2% by the time this airs. But then it's just a matter of hope and pray that it's going to last you as long. It's like, well, if you can just create it, streams of income that pay every single month, there isn't really an end date per se. Well, that takes a lot of stress off here as an individual, I think. Totally. I-, I couldn't agree more. And I can't tell you the number of people who are in there late sixties, early seventies, I've talked to that will say, well, I may have to go back and get gainful employment. Yeah. And when I ask them, why, why would you do that? And they say, well, because I'm, it looks like I'm going to outlive my money. Right. Yeah. And so I need to do that now. Well, that, that should never be the case. Right. That should not be the case for anyone out there that has worked almost their entire life decides to retire. And then, you know, they should be able to to retire comfortably and with dignity. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's one of our goals. We want to create freedom and flexibility for people ultimately. Well, and I think the comfortable part is, you know, a, you know, good segment because, well, yes, in theory, oh, you're not working. Your expenses are going to go down. It's like, okay, yeah, your house might be paid off. You're not paying gas to drive to work. You're not, you know, buying work clothes, all the other stuff they throw in, but, oh, I got all this free time. Let's go on a cruise for two weeks. Well, now that $6,000 $6,000 kind of offsets that $100 gas fill up pretty quickly. <laughs> 100%. Five days, you know, one day of golf is bad enough. You do five or six days of golf or, uh, you know, you've got some expensive hobby that you're taking part in and you can do it all the time. Yeah, it's all true. I One thing you said that struck me, you may remember this from Robert Kiyosaki. He always said that net worth is an opinion. Yep. <laughs> and cash flow is a fact. Mm-hmm. And I think our current system encourages net worth, yeah, but it doesn't really emphasize cash flow, and yep. or it does, but it does it in the W two sense, mm-hmm. you know. So if your only source of cash flow is your W two, yeah, that is not a retirement plan necessarily. Exactly. In my yep. And then like that topic of the net worth, where if the majority of your net worth is tied into a retirement account you can't touch for decades and susceptible to market swings. And then the rest of it's in your house. That's not easily liquid and, you know, could go up, down sideways, you know, not exactly risk-free in my opinion. (laughs) I couldn't agree more. In fact, one of the things we say often with the shred method is people don't have an income problem, right? Most people make enough income and the banks Mm -hmm. have underwritten us. Yeah. for our lifestyle. They know how much we can afford. And they tell yeah. us, you know, sometimes it's way more than we should be buying. Most people don't have an income problem. They have a they have a liquidity problem. Yeah, exactly. Just like you said, it's all locked in qualified funds for a period of time when the liquidity that we actually seek can be obtained by having a really simple tool that virtually every lender out there offers. Right, I agree. So... So now at the time of this recording, and I, I apologize, I wanted to get like 
actual numbers here, but generally yeah. speaking, you know, car loan debt is at an all time high. And I read on Bloomberg that more people are defaulting on their loans than even before the Great Recession. Credit card debt is obviously quite high between the interest rates, inflation, et cetera. And student loan debt just kind of keeps going up and up and up, which personally I find ironic because it's like, okay, you've had a three-year moratorium on interest. You could make principal-only payments like my wife and I have the last three years, yes. but now let's just keep stacking it up. But anyways, you know, taking that all in together, you know, we're talking trillions and trillions of debt out there. And, you know, I'm not even counting mortgages, which I think yeah. are maybe a little bit more of a good debt per se, but yeah. how can the shred method help over, I'll, I'll just say over leveraged families get their lives back on track? Well, the first thing I'll say is it's not a silver bullet. So you can't borrow your way out of a spending problem. <laughs> you um, tell that to Uncle Sam, it seems to be their uh, fix for everything. Another problem, you know, I mean, I look at the US <laughs> debt clock and and you go, this is insurmountable. You can't, we're never going to rein that in, right? No. I mean, it's, there's no way to make enough money to cover the interest expense when it's trillions, when it's 30 to $80 trillion of unfunded liabilities. Yeah. On the individual side, you know, like I said, it's not a magic bullet. What we recommend people do is, and we we have a coaching program that goes along with the shred method that essentially helps people get their, their monthly spend under control. So they have more money yeah. at the end of their month, not more month at the end of their money. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> that is a problem, right? Most people have more month at the end of their money. And, <laughs> and then they, they use, they resort to credit cards and, you know, various other borrowing mechanisms to essentially inflate their income. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, our, our core theory and philosophy is number one, you have to spend less than you make. So if this is, your I was sitting down, that's just like earth shattering shock right there. <laughs> crazy, right? Right. You have to, you have to spend less than you make. And, and once you get that idea in mind, and I think part of this is really critical is understanding that the extra leftover for most people, they go, Oh, well that's savings or yeah. that's, that's earmarked for investing or that's earmarked for whatever, right? A trip. And candidly, some people have multiple of those savings accounts. They've got the sinking fund for the new car and they got a sinking <laughs> yep. fund for the vacation and they got a sinking fund for this and a sinking fund for that. And, and before you know it, you have all these piles or what I like to call buckets of money that are 100% inefficient. Mm -hmm. They're all sitting there. All that money has, has purpose and value and could be used for something, but it's not. It's just sitting there idly. Yep. And all the while we're paying massive compound interest in our amortized mortgage. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is the analogy that I give or the metaphor that I use sometimes, John. Imagine if you left your home in the morning at 8 a.m. to go to the grocery store and you were going to come back in the afternoon. You, you were going to leave in the afternoon to go to the post office. Okay. So you leave at 8, you come back home, you know you're going to leave at 4 to go to the post office. Would you leave your car idling in the driveway all day? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah, why not? Well, it's just going to waste gas, and especially you know, with high gas prices. And well, even going further, it's going to do wear and tear on your engine. And someone could obviously just like, hey, this is running. I'm going to go steal it. <laughs> you name three of the four that I would name. The other one is you know, bad on the environment. Oh, okay. On your I... car. Somebody will steal it. Inefficient with gas. All of the above is the reason we don't do that. Yet what most consumers do is they get paid. Mm -hmm. The money gets deposited into a checking account. The checking account sort of floats up and down, but typically down throughout the two week period before they get paid again through debit card swipes and PayPal and things like things like or bill pay and things like that. Sure. And yet some amount is sitting there. Like right now, I would venture to guess that people have some amount sitting either in their checking or their savings account. Mm -hmm. And it's might sit there for days or weeks or months or sometimes years on end. All the while they're paying massive amounts in interest on their mortgage or their student loan or their car loan. And the shred method, what it does is it, it takes that extra discretionary income, whatever is left over from your income minus your expenses, and it puts it to the most efficient use possible. Okay. Meaning it's either going to eliminate those debts. Typically in snowball fashion, it's going to go after the lowest debt balance first. Sure. We're going to free up some extra cash flow there, but then we just keep going after each next debt. 
the, the, the caveat here is we're using a home equity line of credit a business mm -hmm. line of credit, or in some cases, just a special shred savings account okay. to be able to do this. And the software that powers the shred method is all based on an algorithm that is doing the math for you on the back end about how to save the most amount of interest. Gotcha. Okay. And I think like you said, it's in a way kind of turning what the banks have used on us for maybe hundreds of years against us because they, they understand how interest works and I mean, you kind of mentioned the most efficient use of money. If John goes into the bank of Adam and deposits a thousand dollars, they don't just tuck that under a mattress and say, okay, we'll just leave that for Adam to pick up or idle. If you, if you will, no, they're going to lend that out and earn interest and earn back more money than they're going to pay you an int or me an interest. And then of course we can go down the rabbit hole of fractional reserve banking, but that's a whole nother topic for a podcast. A whole other else. show you and I can yeah. do, I'm sure. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, you're exactly right. They take your they take your thousand dollars. They loan out ten thousand dollars against it, right? That's yeah. the fractional reserve banking piece. And and I think that what what sometimes is surprising for people is to learn that your deposits in a bank are their liabilities. They call yeah. that a liability. The loans that you take out from the bank are their assets. Yep, it's just reverse for you and I. <laughs> That's exactly right. So what if we were thinking differently? like a bank and we're borrowing money short, short term from the bank, mm -hmm. but we're plunking it down on these debts to knock out the debts in record pace. So right. when, you, when you, when you finally get to the point where you're paying off your mortgage or paying down your mortgage, and I don't want to, I, I don't want to create the picture that being 100% debt free is always the answer for some people. Sure. It is for some, it's not, mm -hmm. but what we want to do is we want to get to a point in your mortgage, at least, where a majority of your payment is going to principal every month, right. not to interest every month. Exactly. Because now <laughs> you are literally building your own net worth as opposed to building the asset column of the banker, of the lender. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, it makes sense. With this, Adam, and you know, you've shared, you know, a lot of little nuggets of knowledge of, you know, making the most efficient use of money and having more money go towards principal versus interest. And obviously, you know, everyone's financial situation is different, but since you started this, you know, created the shred method and started helping clients, what, or maybe who has been your greatest success story? And could you maybe share that with my listeners? Man, we've, we've had so many over the last several years and I'll be real candid. One, the first one, and the reason that I felt compelled to share the shred method with everyone was my own story. Okay. Uh, my wife and I, we blasted away our mortgage. It was a $250,000 mortgage when we started, but we knocked it down completely to zero in 3.6 years. Wow. Uh, we saved $180,000 in interest at the time. And what has happened on the back end of that is what you can then do with the equity you have locked in your home is really phenomenal. And that's mm -hmm. the most powerful piece of this. You know, people will think, oh, cool, you, no mortgage payment. That is great. I mean, there is a level of freedom and security that comes with knowing I just have to pay insurance and taxes to live here. But secondly, when you start to deploy that into other investments, the caliber and scale of investments you can get into when you can write a fifty or hundred thousand dollar check change wow. dramatically. Yeah, right. I mean, you're not looking at earning hopefully eight or ten percent in an s and p five hundred index. These are some of these investments will say, well, you know, our IRR is 24% or 20%. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the risk is super minimal because it's all baked into the cake when they buy the deal. Right. Right. And we're talking, I'm talking about syndications and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, other great success stories though, we've had dozens and dozens of people pay off their home entirely and decide, okay, now I'm going to buy the lake home that I've always wanted and sure. been building that life with their family. We had a, a woman who, she was working overtime as a nurse just to get ahead and felt like she was not getting ahead fast enough. Okay. And when we showed her the shred method, she had her entire mortgage paid off. I think she owed 160 maybe, but okay. she had it paid off in a little over a year. Wow. <laughs> she started doing infinite banking where she was overfunding cash value life insurance mm -hmm. and is now doing real estate investing with that money as her downstroke. Wow. And she's, she's, figured it out. I mean, we, we help coach along the way, how to crack that code. We call it a 10 year freedom plan. But when you start to see people do it 
And then they realize the power of mm -hmm. clawing back. And this is literally what you're doing. You're clawing back 20, 30, $40,000 a year in interest sometimes. Wow. That, that is going out the door. So imagine giving yourself a $20,000 raise in year one. Yeah. What would, what would that do for you? Mm -hmm. I'm going to just go out on a limb that I don't know, the big names, Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, they're probably not saying, hey, contact this guy, Adam. He's going to save you a ton of money and we're going to yeah. lose our shorts with our interest payments. <laughs> yeah. I keep thinking that, you know, we're probably an acquisition target at some point for a <laughs> Wells Fargo type company to be like, we're going to pull the plug on these guys. They, I don't want them doing what they're doing anymore. Exactly. Um, what's amazing is, you know, the, the banks have not made it easy no. by and large. No. to make lump sum principal payments. I mean, they'll no. just like student lenders, that's the big one of the biggest scams there is out there. Uh -huh. I send in a huge chunk of money and they apply it to future payments. Yep. Right. And those future payments still cost you a ton of money in interest. And mm -hmm. I mean, they're literally gaming the system to their own benefit. Yeah. And when you start working with a lender or a bank and you figure out the process of, oh, I'm going to send a lump sum payment and you know exactly how it's sent and how it's credited and what it does to your amortization table. Yeah. It's kind of intoxicating. Exactly. Like, when can I write the next big check <laughs> yeah. that will take me from payment 12 to payment 26 to payment 47 to payment, you know, right. You, you can shred a mortgage in three to seven years for wow. the most part using our plan, no matter what kind of income or expense you have based on okay. your, your current debt structure. And I'm going to assume, obviously, at the time of this recording, you know, if we record this a year ago, we'd be talking, you know, two, three, four percent mortgage interest rates. Now we're six, seven, maybe getting up to eight percent. I'm assuming that's uh, the interest rate doesn't isn't taken into account as much as people would probably think with the shred method. It's what's staggering about that is when we had three percent interest rates, and people would say it's the cheapest money I'll ever have. Why would I ever pay off my mortgage? <laughs> yeah. And we would run the numbers and show them the effective APR when you use the shred method can be as low as 0.3 to 0.5%. Wow. <laughs> so at 6%, we can actually get people back down into the 2 to 3% range for effective APR, sometimes as low as 1.5, depending on their discretionary income. Okay. So, you know, again, when, you know, you go, well, it's the cheapest money I'll ever have. <laughs> it really isn't. Yeah. I can get you cheaper, no question. Okay. And, and to your point, I... I'm not a, I'm not a all debt is bad guy mm -hmm. because I think if you're going to take on debt, the debt that you take on should be making you money. Exactly. Not costing you money. It should be making you money. So you're borrowing money to invest in other real estate deals or business or what have you. But if this is all consumer debt and it's mm -hmm. you know, doodads and uh, Dolce whatever. Gabbana handbags uh, yeah. and sunglasses or the new Porsche or whatever. <laughs> that is not the path to, to wealth, security, freedom, and certainty. Exactly. So, well, I appreciate you, you sharing this, Adam. You know, like I said, a couple of wheels have even turned in my head, even though I'm kind of familiar with how, you know, the interest rates work, amortization, et cetera. But yeah. if any of my listeners, you know, maybe wanted to reach out, maybe they're starting to feel it's like, Oh, geez, you know, I'd love to pay my mortgage off in, you know, even 10 years versus, you know, 15, 20, 30. What's the best way to reach out to you, learn more about the shred method and, you know, maybe even do some calculations for them? Yeah, very simply, if they go to the shred method.com. Okay. At the shred method.com, we have three resources there for people. Number one is a savings calculator. So you can plug in raw numbers, you know, income, mortgage expense, interest rate monthly expenses, a raw rough number, and okay. it'll kick out. Here's how fast you could be out of debt and how much you would save over time. Okay. It's basically a projection tool. Secondly, we have a masterclass that is an evergreen webinar, basically, that people can watch. And it is very, very eye-opening as to you know how fast most people can leverage this. Okay. And then lastly, we have a HELOC guide that's downloadable. That's just a PDF document that will show you what, you know, what do you need in terms of that tool? from a home okay. equity line of credit, personal line of credit, business line of credit, or just a shred savings account will also work. All right. So the shredmethod.com is the best place to go for all that. Perfect.
Sounds good. And as always, for those listening, if you're driving, working out, walking the dog, or if you're like me chasing a toddler around the house while listening to this, I'll <laughs> have these all in a clickable format in the show notes for you. So Adam, it's been a pleasure to meet with you and thanks for sharing the shred method. John, thanks for having me on. Keep doing what you do, man. This is super important stuff. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for listening. Be sure to share, rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. For more updates, check out www.wealthandfreedomnexus.com. Remember, nothing on this show should be considered tax, legal, investment, or professional advice. This show is produced solely for educational and informational purposes. Please consult an appropriate and licensed tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for specific advice for your situation. For distribution or publication rights or media interviews, please contact the host.